Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar, Using Shall Carefully for Clearer Laws, brought to you by NCSL. All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode, and the floor will be open for your questions and comments during the presentation. If you would like to submit a question at any time during the webinar, you may use the chat box located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Simply type your message into the box and click on the Send button. If you should require assistance throughout the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad to reach a live operator. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Kay Warnock. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Welcome to today's webinar. This webinar is sponsored by the Legal Services Staff Section and is supported by an NCSL e-learning grant. Over 185 registrants from 39 states and two territories are participating today. If any of your colleagues are missing this event, the webinar is being recorded and I will send you all the link as soon as possible once it's available. Our moderator today is Wendy Jackson. She is a senior legislative editor with the Legislative Reference Bureau in Wisconsin. Wendy is also the co-chair of the Legal Services Staff Section Program Development Committee, and she was instrumental in getting this topic to the webinar platform. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you, Kay, and thank you to everyone out there joining us today. As Kay mentioned, I'm Wendy Jackson. I'm a legislative editor for the Wisconsin LRB. And I have the pleasure today of introducing my colleague and our esteemed presenter. I'm also the person to whom Becky Tradewell could not say no when I asked her to present this webinar, and I'm so grateful she said yes. Becky Tradewell has been a legislative drafter at the Wisconsin LRB since 1985 and a managing attorney since 1998. She is also the shepherdess of our drafting manual and a wise consultant on all things LRB. Before I give Becky the floor, I'd like to repeat um, two things to remind you to please take some time to post questions in the chat box on the right side of your screen. Um, Becky will answer um, your questions at the end of the presentation. And thank you to the Legal Services Staff Section and to the NCSL eLearning Grant Fund for supporting this webinar. And now, Here's Becky. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you for your support and help in preparing the materials for this presentation. Um, and also for your generous uh, praise when I gave the seminar on this subject last year, which made it easier for her to get me to say yes to doing this for you all today. Um, in, here at the LRB in our slower summers, which are the even-numbered years, we do a series of in-house seminars called the Summer of Enrichment. And last year I suggested that shall would be a good topic for a seminar and volunteered to present it. Then I thought, what was I doing? I'm no grammarian, and grammar can be so boring. But some people also have very strong opinions about it boring and controversial at the same time. That's some combination. I've been thinking more about the way we use, the ways we use shall in our drafting. Our drafting manual has rules about using the word, but we don't really emphasize it. And I was seeing some uses that troubled me some. Uh, the ultimate inspiration for doing this presentation, it was kind of the last straw, was a drafting request with a stated intent of modernizing a chapter of the statutes. It was presented in the form of an 80-page draft. Much of the language was legalese. It certainly wasn't modern. The draft was difficult to read and sometimes impossible to understand. There, and there were numerous problems with how shall was used. Working on this draft helped overcome my reluctance to tackle the subject and uh, and do a presentation to my, to my colleagues. This draft didn't actually say food shall be pure, but that's how I came to think about it. And so that inspired the, the title for this presentation today. And um, here are some of the examples of the way the word shall was used in this pre-drafted uh, draft that I received. Um, the repeal of this provision of the statutes shall take effect 
on a certain effective date. Uh, here's another example. Food, food sold in this state shall comply with applicable standards of identity. And one more. Milk from animals other than cows shall be labeled to show the type of animal from which the milk is obtained. The issues that I want to talk about today are the false imperative, what I'm calling the wrong actor problem, the use of shall have been, and the passive voice. Why do we have difficulties using shall in our drafting? It's been written that shall is the most misused word in legal writing. Apparently in some countries, drafting authorities have decided that drafters cannot be trusted to use shall properly and have forbidden its use. I don't know whether that's the case in, in any uh, states, but uh, in some other countries. Part of the problem may stem from the fact that we don't use the word very much outside of drafting. And when we do, we don't usually use it to command something or impose a duty. Sometimes shall is used to express futurity, according to the dictionary, as in shall, we shall see or to express that something is ineb inevitable or likely to happen. The sun shall rise tomorrow. Or to express determination, as in we shall overcome, or perhaps I shall sue. As the Chicago Manual of Style puts it, shall is now a relatively rare word in American English, except in first-person jocular uses like shall we dance? <coughs> Excuse me. Another source of the problem is historical. As with so much legal writing, it's the way lawyers have always written, and it's the way so many laws are written. Many examples exist in the statutes and in drafts proposed uh, by people from outside our drafting agency. It generally makes sense to model a new law on an existing one, but sometimes there are problems with existing language that we should try not to reproduce. We've all heard criticisms of traditional legal writing in general and statutes in particular. Um, I'm going to quote from an article that I found on the Internet titled Plain Language, Drafting and Property Law by Professor Peter Butt. Many statutes, particularly older statutes, are drafted with an egregious verbosity. When coupled with archaic language, the result is a heady mix that tests both concentration and knowledge. To me, they call to mind Lord Justice Harmon's experience on reading the English Housing Act of 1957. To reach a conclusion on this matter involved the court in wading through a monstrous legislative morass, staggering from stone to stone and ignoring the marsh gas exhaling from the forest of schedules lining the way on each side. I, re I regarded it at one time, I must confess, as a slough of despond through which the court would never drag its feet. But I have, by leaping from tussock to tussock as best I might, eventually, pale and exhausted, reached the other side. Sometimes I do feel that the criticisms of the way statutes are written go too far. Some laws are intended to be very complex, and it just isn't possible to write them in a simple way. I should say that Professor Butt's opinion is that, in England at least, legislative drafters are ahead of their attorney colleagues in private practice in moving away from the kind of awful legal writing that he decries. I think another source of the problems that we have with the word shall is that drafters have been told that laws prohibit, authorize, or require. And if we're asked to draft one that doesn't prohibit or authorize, we think it must require, necessitating the use of shall. We feel as though a law can't co accomplish something unless it uses shall. This relates to the problem of the false imperative, which we'll talk about in a moment. Why should we care about using, about the way we use shall? Well, we want to ensure that statutory language says what it's intended to mean and minimize the chances that will be, it will be misinterpreted to make the statutes easier to read, and to use correct grammar. Shall is used more than 51,000 times in the Wisconsin statutes. And it's a very important word in the statutes because we use it to require people to do things. 
So when we do use it, it's good to be that sure that we use it clearly. So the first issue to discuss today is the false imperative. In preparing for the for this uh, presentation, I looked up the word shall in the in the dictionary. I like to use Merriam Webster's um, online dictionary. For one thing, they have vocabulary quizzes, which I enjoy in, in my spare time. Um, I looked up shall primarily to see what the various definitions uh, were given, and the one that seems most relevant to the statutes is the second definition. It's used to express a command or exhortation or used in laws, regulations, or directives to express what is mandatory. But what really caught my eye um, when I was looking at the definition was the part of speech indicated, or what the dictionary calls the functional classification, verbal auxiliary. By the way, the Chicago Manual of Style has an interesting discussion of, of auxiliary verbs which include can, have, and will. According to the manual, an auxiliary verb is a highly irregular verb, and maybe that's why we have some trouble using it. Uh, what, is, what is an auxiliary verb? According to the dictionary, it accompanies another verb and typically expresses person, number, mood, or tense. In this case, we are concerned about mood. And mood is the distinction of the form of a verb to express whether the action or state it denotes is conceived as fact or in some other manner, as command, possibility, or wish. The imperative mood expresses a command or requirement. It is used to impose a duty. Most often, when we're not inside the law, commands are given without using shall and the subject is understood. For example, do not enter. Outside of drafting, I don't find myself using the imperative mood very often, though when my children were younger, I used to try to lay down the law, like wipe your feet. I didn't say it in the way a statute might say it, though. For example, you shall clean your room, I think the children would have thought me either strange or funny, or both, which they often did, I guess. The imperative mood is often the correct mood for a statute. When you want to impose a duty, the imperative is the mood to use, and shall is the right word for the job. For example, the department shall make grants to eligible counties from this appropriation. Sometimes statutory provisions aren't meant to command, but they're meant to state legal facts or results, to declare a legal result. If the law says something is so, it is so. The indicative mood is the mood to use to state a fact or declare something. A false imperative appears to impose a duty, but it does not. A sentence that uses the false imperative is meant to state a fact or declare a legal result. This is what the dictionary says about indicative. It represents the denoted act or state as an objective fact. The idea that we can make something so without using shall can be a difficult concept especially given how frequently the false imperative tends to appear in statutes. When I, it, it just sounds, the false imperative sounds right to us. When I presented this on this subject last summer, I could tell there was some skepticism about eliminating shall in some of the examples of the false imperative that I gave. So I'm going to try to start with some that I think are fairly easy to accept and try to work up to some uh, ones that might meet more resistance. Uh, some definitions use the false imperative. For example, permit officer shall mean any person designated by the department to issue child labor permits. 
the way I thought about this was the lawgiver telling the term, thou shalt mean any person designated by the department to issue child labor permits. And the poor term saying, what am I supposed to do? As uh, as I, to paraphrase an article about legal drafting on the Oregon State Bar online site, the drafter has obligated a poor hapless term to mean something. And what happens if the term refuses this command? Whereas if we say to the term, this is what you mean, the term can, can understand that and doesn't have to do anything about it. Our style in Wisconsin is to use means rather than shall mean. I put this example in um, because I just like the idea that the term shops not only has to mean something, but it also has to embrace these various things that it's supposed to mean. Our, as I said, our style now is to is to just say means rather than shall mean in a definition. And I am going to talk to our revising attorney about um, trying to eliminate the shall means that we still have in the statutes uh, in a revision bill. But I know that in some other states, the, the style is still to use shall mean um, in definitions. Another example of the use of the false imperative that seems fairly easy to, to accept is using shall and expressing the amount of a fee. For example, the fee for a milk producer license is $100. Sorry. The fee for a milk producer license shall be $100. That is the false imperative. To put that sentence into the indicative mood, the fee for a milk producer license is $100. Effective dates are another place where we sometimes see the false imperative. And I'm going back to the example that I showed from the, from the difficult um, draft that inspired this uh, presentation. The repeal of this shall take effect on the effective date of the rules promulgated under a section of this act. Some grammarians would say that this is actually an example of inappropriately using the future tense. I'm not sure. I think maybe it's ambiguous in that respect. It probably doesn't matter since the problem is essentially the same. An effective date should be written, This, the, the repeal takes effect on whatever date uh, you, you wish. For some reason, I'm having trouble getting back to the slide that I want. There we go. Occurrences of the false imperative may not be obvious to, to us when we're drafting. To tell whether a sentence contains the false imperative, try substituting has a duty to or, requ or is required to for shall and ask yourself whether the resulting sentence makes any sense. The commission shall have jurisdiction to enforce payment. Well, how about what you really want to do here, I think, is give the commission jurisdiction to enforce payment. So you could just say the, the, the commission has jurisdiction to enforce payment or even may enforce payment. Sometimes with these sentences, you have to step back and think, what am I really trying to say, and, and completely reword it, and not just replace, you know, shall have with has. Similarly, the board shall have all powers necessary to carry out the provisions of this chapter. What you're really trying to do is give the board those powers, not say that Somebody is going to give the board the powers. It's not that the board has a duty to have all these powers. It's that the law is giving 
the board the powers. Another place where I sometimes see, one sometimes sees the false imperative is uh, in a penalty um, or in a criminal provision. Uh, here it says any per that this person shall be guilty of perjury. Well, actually, we would say, our form, would, our form, our style would be to say, is guilty of perjury. Um, here is another example. In an administrative hearing under this section, the petitioner shall have the burden of proof. What this, what this sentence is really trying to do is allocate the burden of proof to the petitioner. So what it needs to say is the petitioner has the burden of proof. Well, this is kind of a difficult sentence to work your way through, um, and only partly because it, it can, includes the false imperative. It has the false imperative and it's written in the passive voice. So you can't really tell who it is who can cancel the license for, for any of these reasons. Um, so it could probably re be worded, reworded to either say that the license may be canceled or perhaps the department may cancel a license if the license was granted on a check and the check bounces or something to that effect. Another use of the false imperative, this is in a list of members of a, of a board or a council in our statutes. And it says, one member appointed by the Senate Majority Leader sh who shall have venture capital, investment banking, or substantial entrepreneurial experience. Aside from the danger that it looks like it's requiring the majority leader to have this kind of experience. Um, it is written in the false imperative. Alternatives for this might be to either say one member appointed by the Senate majority leader, period, the majority leader shall appoint a person with this kind of experience, or you could reset structure the whole thing, I think, to say one member with venture capital, investment banking, or substantial entrepreneurial experience, comma, appointed by the Senate Majority Leader. This is an example that I found where one of my colleagues had eliminated the false imperative from a statute when she was uh, drafting a bill to amend the statute for another reason. Um, it isn't always appropriate to make this kind of change, but it is something to think about when you have the opportunity. On the, on the website for this presentation, uh, there's a link to some Colorado documents, including guidelines on when you might eliminate this kind of problem, a problem with the use of, of shall when amending. Colorado also has an interesting approach to issues related to shall. A bill became law this year that defines shall and must throughout the statutes. And your, the materials include the session law and the guidelines for the use of those terms. I want to thank Tom Morris um, from the Colorado Office of Legislative Services. Uh, he's a senior attorney there for uh, providing the Colorado materials for us. We have received some questions about the use of much, uh, which I was kind of actually hoping to avoid <coughs> dealing with. Um, but we'll see if we can uh, talk about it a little bit at the end of the presentation. The false imperative of few, appears fairly frequently in our current drafts, or at least it did before my presentation on this subject, subject last summer, which I'm sure uh, had such an influence over all my colleagues that none of us are using it anymore. In the outline, then, you'll see a couple of quotes from uh, bill drafting manuals about the form about the false imperative. I, I didn't try to look at all of the state's drafting manuals, but I know that some, some other manuals also address this issue. For example, um, Pennsylvania's, I noticed, did. So the next issue 
is the what I call the wrong actor problem. There's probably a real name for this, but I don't know what it is. When a statute prohibits, authorizes, or requires something, it needs to be clear who is the subject of the prohibition, authorization, or requirement. Many statutes that you shall are, are actually meant to impose a duty. They're, they're properly written in the imperative mood, but they impose the duty on the wrong actor. Here is an example. The deputy shall receive such compensation as the board provides. And I visualize the deputy saying, well, that's great, but what am I supposed to do about it? So instead, you could write that the board shall determine the amount of the deputy's compensation. Here's another example from our statute. The following shall receive low-income energy assistance. Perhaps the statute should say, the department shall provide low-income en energy assistance to the following, or the following persons are eligible for low-income energy assistance under this section. Sometimes when a sentence uses the wrong actor problem, the real serious difficulty is that you can't tell who it is who is actually supposed to be doing what the what's necessary to make sure that the statute has, it, has the effect that's wanted. For example, the successor guardian shall receive a copy of this court order and, uh, of, the, and well, of, the, of these two court orders, sorry. And I'm sure the successor guardian would want that, but who is responsible for giving those copies to the successor guardian? There are quite a number of statutes uh, like that where you can't tell who it is who is supposed to make sure that somebody receives something. It, I noticed that it, several of these examples use, are ones that use the word receive. And receive is very much like, like putting uh, the sentence in the passive voice, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. This sentence is, like, is very much like, shall be given a copy. And, and again, you don't know uh, who is supposed to make sure that this happens. Typically, I think, with the, with the wrong actor problem, the, the entity that's being told to do something isn't capable of action at all. It's something that can't act, like food. So food sold in this state shall comply with applicable standards of identity. Who is required to do or is prohibited from doing what in this case? Alternatives to this approach might be something like a person may not sell a food for which a standard of identity exists unless the food complies with the standard of identity, or a person who sells a food that does not comply with the standard of identity for the food may be fired, required to forfeit a certain amount of money. In this example, which is not from our statutes, it came from a, a model law. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult sentence to work your way through, too, I think, aside from the fact that it's written in the false imperative. I'm sorry, it, sorry it, it has the wrong actor problem. Any information reported publicly as required under this section shall follow a risk adjustment process that is consistent with the National Healthcare Safety Network and use its risk adjustment de de definitions. I think that they meant to say something like this. Before reporting information on healthcare associated infections to the public under this section, the department shall adjust the data using a risk adjustment process that is consistent with the process used by the National Healthcare Safety Network. Still not necessarily an easy sentence to work your way through, but at least it's telling the department what it has to do rather than telling the information to do something. One of my current favorite examples of the wrong actor problem comes from an administrative rule that relates to blasting. And it says, 
Rock traveling in the air or along the ground shall meet all of the following conditions. And one of the conditions is that rocks, that the rock not be cast more than one half the distance to the nearest inhabited building. So um, now we come to uh, probably the most common use of example of the wrong a actor problem that I know of in our statutes. We require a department to promulgate rules, and then we say the rules shall inc include all of the following. This isn't so terrible because you can see who it is who has to do this. It's right there. It's the department. But still, you're telling rules to do something, and it's pretty easy to avoid the problem, to avoid doing that by just saying the department shall promulgate rules that include all of the following. The, the has, a, has a duty to test is also very helpful in, in spotting the wrong actor problem. And I've uh, quoted the provision in the, in the outline, I've quoted the provision from the bill draft, our bill drafting manual um, on the subject of the, the wrong actor problem. Uh, I noticed when I was working on this uh, submittal last year that there are a number of occurrences of shall have been on the in in our statutes, which seem kind of odd to me. In the when I started researching this, I came across some information on grammar that I've included in the outline. It's not crucial to understanding this point, and it's nothing anybody has to remember, but I included it because it was completely new and surprising to me. Will have been expresses the future perfect tense in the passive voice, or the future, con future perfect continuous, or future perfect progressive tense. It describes something that is expected to have been done before a future time or event, or something that is expected to continue until a time or event in the future. These are my efforts at sentences, first in the future perfect tense in the passive voice, and second in the future perfect continuous or future perfect progressive tense. Um, the first one I think you might call the wishful thinking tense. Shall have been is sometimes used in the same way, although according to the Chicago Manual of Style, shall is not preferred in the future perfect tense. Here's my effort at using shall in this way. I shall have been dozing for 45 minutes when this presentation is over. Here are some examples of shall have been in our statutes. In this first one, the county treasurer has to pay 5% of the minimum tax of all dogs license taxes, which shall have been received by the county treasurer. In this and some other of the examples, it seems as though it's just trying to describe something that has that happens or has happened or is going to happen. And in this case, I think you could just say all of the dog license taxes which ha have been collected or even I'm sorry, received, or just which are received, or that are received by the county treasurer. Sometimes shall have been seems to be intended to, to state a precondition or a condition for receiving a grant, for example, but it doesn't clearly do that. <clears throat> this statute is describing a situation in which someone is not required to get a fish stocking permit. And uh, again, it's one of those sentences that's difficult to work one's way through. I think this was intended, for example, the Milwaukee paper newspaper does a, a sports show every year, and they have fish tanks where they let people fish. And I think this was intended to allow them to not have to get uh, a um, fish docking permit. But I'm just going to read it, read through this first sentence. The requirement of being issued a permit under this section does not apply to civic organizations, organizations operating newspapers or television stations, or promoters of sports shows, 
when and in connection with publicly showing or exhibiting, giving demonstrations with, or providing fishing of fish for periods of not to exceed 10 days, if the fish are placed in a tank or an artificially constructed pond that is a self-contained body of water. This part of this statute existed for some time before the second sentence was added. And I can understand why the drafter didn't want to just add another condition at the end of that first sentence. But I'm not sure that the approach in the draft uh, that, that got enacted into the statutes is particularly helpful. Fish used for these purposes shall have been certified by a qualified inspector to meet the fish health standards and requirements promulgated under Section 95.60 4SB. Ideally, I think when faced with a provision of the statutes like this, one would approach it by restructuring the, the statute to clearly provide an exemption from obtaining a permit with conditions one of the conditions being that a fish, in, a qualified inspector certifies the health of the fish or has certified um, the health of the fish. Another approach might be to say something like, a person may not publicly show or exhibit fish under this exemption unless they've been certified to meet the fish health standards. Shall have been seems to, oh wait, I'm not done yet. One more example. Now, this came from the Great Lakes Water Resources Compact, so it's quite a recent uh, statute. And it was kind of a double-edged sword for me. Uh, there were a lot of problems with understanding the language of the Great Lakes Water Resources Compact, but I couldn't change them because they had to, it had to be enacted in substantially the same form by all the parties. So on the one hand, I didn't have to do a lot of work, but on the other hand, I had to put into statutes a uh, statute that really is, is difficult, very unnecessarily difficult to understand, I think I could say. Um, in this case, one might rewrite this provision to say, unless the, the uh, project has been approved, is approved, or or taking a different approach, you can't do this without the approval of the originating party. Shall have been, uh, seems to be widely used, or at least used to be widely used in legal documents, and it still appears in the statutes, but it seems unlikely to me that it would ever be necessary to use that phrase in a law. If it is necessary to use the future perfect passive or the future perfect continuous in a law, it would be better to use will and reserve shall for making commands. When you're asked to draft shall have been, find yourself writing that phrase or asked to amend a statute that uses it, consider whether the language is intended to oppose a duty on someone. If so, try rewording the language so that it actually clearly imposes the duty on the, on the person. If not, stop and try to think what it is that the statute is meant to say and reword the language without using shall. I think it can help to just pretend you're explaining this proposed law to somebody else. How would you say it in ordinary language? And then see if you can't work that into, into your draft. And the last issue for today is passive voice. We've all heard about the passive voice but I, and, and the problems that it can cause, but I think it's worth discussing because, as a legal writing authority said with, I think, some understatement, lawyers overuse the passive voice. In the passive voice, the subject is acted upon. That is, it receives the action of the verb, whereas in the active voice, the subject does the acting. The passive voice doesn't necessarily involve shall, for example, the famous mistakes were made, but in statutes it, it very commonly does. The passive voice isn't a grammatical or logical error in and of itself, but the actual active voice is usually preferable in drafting if only because it involves fewer words and a more familiar word order. 
There are situations, <clears throat> excuse me, in which the passive voice is preferable or even necessary. For example, when the actors are numerous or unknown. But I don't see why anybody would feel like the, would feel the need to draft the deputy shall be appointed by the clerk. Sorry. Yeah, the de deputy shall be appointed by the clerk of court rather than the clerk of point clerk of court shall appoint the deputy. Or the secretary shall be elected by the committee from among its non legislator members rather than the committee shall elect the secretary and so on. Here's another example. No land shall be purchased and no contract or contracts entered into for the purchase of any land by any state agency until the purchase is approved in writing by the governor. That takes 32 words. Rewriting it into the active voice, a state agency may not purchase land without the written approval of the governor. That takes 13 words. Now you might say, well, it should say, or enter into a contract for the purchase of any land. I don't think that's necessarily, that would, is necessarily the case, but either way, you will have saved a bunch of words and saved some um, work from your reader by rewording this into the active voice. The real danger with the passive voice is that you don't name the person who has the responsibility to take the action. And in, um, this again came from my food shall be pure draft. Cheese manufactured, sold, or distributed in the state shall be labeled according to rules promulgated by the department. It doesn't tell you anything about who is supposed to label the cheese or what sort of label they have to put on the cheese. Although it does, um, it does at least indicate that there are going to be some rules that presumably will, will give you the information that you need to know. An alternative, because the, the, the principles about labeling cheese may be, and I think are, quite complicated, and we don't necessarily need to put them all in the statutes. So an alternative would be to require the department to promulgate rules setting forth the, st the standards for labeling cheese and then providing a penalty for somebody who doesn't uh, follow the rules. You'll notice here that in my hypothetical rewrite, the penalty is very serious. It's a felony because we take cheese very seriously in this state. But here, here is an example of where the passive voice is dangerous because it does not tell you who has to give notice. Um, and, and that's a very important thing to make sure that the child's parent actually does get notice. So... In, in summary um, of, the, of the, uh, the issues that I've talked about so far, when you're drafting, I suggest and I try to consider whether to reword a sentence that contains shall be, shall have, or shall have been to eliminate those phrases. And also consider whether a sentence that includes the word shall is meant to impose a duty and if so, whether it imposes the duty on the right person. And also, I think it's good to keep in mind when you're amending uh, a statute that, that has a problem with shall in it, uh, consider whether it's appropriate to rewrite uh, the sentence so that it, it doesn't um, have the problem with shall in it anymore. So uh, that's, that is my presentation, and 
as I mentioned, we um, received some questions in advance. Um, one was about um, using the word must when it's appropriate or if it's ever appropriate to use the word must in the statutes. And we don't have a, a rule about using must. I, uh, I think that there are situations in which it's appropriate to use must. The, the law uh, passed and adopted in Colorado this year defines must to mean as, as follows. Must means that a person or thing is required to meet a condition for a consequence to apply. Must does not mean that a person has a duty. Uh, I, I think some people think that we can solve all the problems with shall by using must instead, but I think that the same problems that you can have with shall, can, that the ones that I've talked about today, can arise when you use must. So it, while I think it's appropriate to use it in some situations, it, it, it doesn't necessarily solve all the problems uh, with shall. And let's see. Uh, other questions had to do with using with how you prohibit a person from doing something. And our style in Wisconsin is to say no person may or a person may not. We use may to forbid behavior. And I know we're not the only state to do that, although we may be in a minority. I know in a lot of states um, the, the, the form is a, a person shall not. Um, I think there have been discussions of this among people who have more expertise than I do for a long time. I think, too, that the, probably the most important thing is to have a style and stick to it. We actually have a, a, a Wisconsin Supreme Court case that recognizes that uh, no person may is a prohibition, so um, we don't really have to worry too much about the courts misinterpreting it. I also think that ordinary people um, would understand no person may to be to be a prohibition. I do think that if you're going to use uh, shall when you do a prohibition, you shouldn't say no person shall because that means no person has a duty to, assuming that shall means has a duty to. Um, in terms of trying to evaluate using shall or may, in uh, when you're doing a pro when you're making a prohibition, I think when you're trying to evaluate the use of shall, it depends on whether you would convert a a person shall not to mean a person does not have a duty to, or a person is not required to, and and I don't know how, you know, what the what the proper analysis of that is. We also had a question in advance. I thought I had these questions right here. Um, about about imposing penalties. Where is that? And it was basically asking um, whether it whether there's a problem with saying a judge um, shall sentence a person. In, in Wisconsin, we have a, have a maybe unusual approach to imposing penalties. Um, we usually say in, in the criminal code, we have categories of uh, classes of, of misdemeanors and classes of felonies. And so the the, pro, the a criminal provision would say a person who does X is guilty of a Class B felony or a Class C felony, and then um, there's a provision that explains what the penalties are for for each one of those um, classes of penalty. Ah, someone asked whether the inappropriate use of shall has reached the level of a court case. And uh, I'm sure that it has, 
but I am not. Uh, I I do not have um, any case law uh, to back up my my feeling that it probably has. It it might be interesting if if somebody is aware of any cases that address that issue. Um, here's a question that says, does preference for the active voice construction give up anything in, term of, in terms of em emphasis? My feeling about that is that emphasis is something to worry about when you're writing a brief or a story, but it isn't really an issue when you're writing a law. Uh, I, I don't think, I think, you know, when you're writing a law, you have to get people to read the whole sentence and understand what it means, and I think the active voice is the way that best accomplishes that. Are we good? Okay, well, thank you all very much for your kind attention. And, um, oh, one other thing I wanted to say was I, I uh, with the materials, uh, the, uh, there's a link on the website to some statutory uses of shall that I, I had um, provided as, oh, I know, I think it was sent out in the email that I had provided to people. And if anybody um, wants to communicate with me about those, uh, my contact information is available on the last slide here. So anyway, thank you very much, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. This does conclude today's teleconference. We thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time and have a great day.